Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CRM MVP podcast, episode 101. This week, we're going to get back to the series that we started a couple of episodes ago called Love It or Hate It. And today, we're going to be focusing on features that are available to the general Dynamics 365 and even Power Apps, model driven apps, that is, uh, functionality. I want to talk about some features that have been around for a while and essentially, you know, talk about my thoughts on those features and whether I still find them useful or not and, you know, all of that. But before we do that, before we get to the list of the top 10 things in, you know, Dynamics or, you know, Power Apps that whether I love them or hate them, I want to say thank you to everyone who have been listening to the show, you know, for all these years. A lot of people send me congratulations and, you know, super nice messages through Twitter or email or LinkedIn or whatever it is. Um, a lot of them are CRM MVPs like myself who have been guests on the show, who listen to the show, who have hosted the show in the past. And I really appreciate the feedback. I think that within the community of podcasters as a whole, regardless of the topic that you talk about, 100 episodes seems to be kind of the the, the big milestone that a lot of shows strive for. Um, because if you think about it, I mean, even if you do it weekly, which this show is every two weeks, uh, but even if you do a weekly, it takes almost two years of nonstop weekly episodes to be able to get to 100. I know that because we have a, a weekly kind of show, but is in our YouTube channel called Two Minute Tuesdays, and we are about 170 episodes in, and it's kind of, uh, it's a big challenge to do it every week nonstop at the same time, and that's what we've been able to do now for, for a few years, and that's why we are you know, on episode 170 or whatever it is. But when it comes to the podcast, because it's not only tough to come up with ideas for the show and, and what to cover, but also to discover who would be the best person to talk about this topic. I'm not always the best person to talk about a topic. So I, I kind of try to bring in the people that I consider to be experts on particular, you know, episodes and whatnot. Uh, it, it becomes challenging. So hitting 100 for any podcast, uh, it's, it's kind of a big deal, a big milestone. And I think that other MVPs that have their own show saw that and send me congratulations or gave me shout outs on their show. And I appreciate that. I listened to those shows and, um, you know, I was I was really happy to hear that. Of course, I can't wait to have them again back on the show, co-hosting or even hosting the the, the show because, um, you know, I learned tremendous amount of information from them. So thank you so much. And obviously all of you, you know, the ones that didn't congratulate me, but still listening to the show, I appreciate the feedback and you know, and I appreciate the fact that you still listen to the show after all these years. So once again, today, I want to get back to the, the series that we started a few episodes ago called Love It or Hate It. Some of this functionality has been out for, you know, over 10 years. Some of it is fairly new, but I want to talk about kind of my thoughts on these pieces of functionality and whether I still love them or hate them or what I think about them. So once again, uh, the list of 10 pieces of functionality in Dynamics and, and model-driven apps, and we'll see how we think about it. So number one is the more addresses functionality. Maybe you haven't seen this because it's not predominantly displayed. Back in CRM 4.0, CRM 5.0, which was CRM 2011, I think they were more predominantly displayed. Once we got upgraded in CRM 2011 to the newest you know, functionality when we started kind of switching to what became the new forms and the new UI, which was recently replaced by the unified interface. Um, that interface was introduced in CRM 2011. And before that, um, I think I think it was CRM 2011 update roll up 12, uh, something like that. So it wasn't right at the beginning. It was it was a while after CRM 2011 was out. So the previous functionality, the classic forms, they, they came out of the box on the account entity with a grid that connected to a, a child record or, or a child entity called addresses or more addresses uh, to be more specific. The idea for this functionality was that if you have a customer that has five locations, let's just say, you could enter this customer once as a company 
and then enter each location as an address. That's the idea. Or, because it also works for contacts, if you have a contact or a person in Dynamics and that person has multiple locations, multiple addresses, right? They have their home, their office, they have a vacation home, whatever it is, you can enter them there rather than creating multiple contacts because the fields that capture addresses within the account and the contact entity are limited. We have mainly two out of the box, address one and address two fields. Anything beyond that, you're looking at either adding more fields or just using the more address entity. But here's what happens. The more address entity is not a very useful entity whatsoever because all you do is you capture addresses and that's it. So let's talk about, for example, from the account perspective. Why would anyone want to capture the five locations for a customer or the 10 locations for a customer or 100 locations for a customer? Why would anyone want to capture that? If you're talking about a customer, typically, and I'm not going to say in 100% of the cases, this is not an absolute thing, but typically, I would say probably 99% of the cases, the idea behind storing multiple locations for a customer has a meaning. And that meaning is that you can provide services or work for those locations. For example, in my case, as an implementer of Dynamics, I work with companies that have multiple locations all the time. But when I do projects, I'm typically dealing with headquarters. I'm typically dealing with the CIOs and the you know, the IT directors of, of the company, you know, of the world. Um, I'm not dealing with the locations per se, even though my project and my software and my training even will involve people in those different locations. And I perhaps have to go into multiple locations, which I enjoy, by the way, uh, pre-COVID. You know, um, I, I, I personally liked when customers would say, you know, would you be okay to you know, go to four of our locations and just train people locally. No problem. Let's go because I, I get to learn their business even more. And some locations were pretty cool. Like we get to go to their factories and how they do things. And, you know, I'm an engineer, so all of that is fascinating to me. I get to pretend that, you know, I need a tour of the factory. Just I think it makes me a better solution architect. But no, I just want to I just want to see how you guys do things. Um, and and I, I personally enjoy that. But I don't keep those locations in Dynamics. Those you know, those destinations, those addresses are meaningless to me as a company. That's why I don't enter them in the system. If I was to enter them in the system, if, 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 if they meant something to me, meaning I am actually doing work at that location, I'm, I'm going to install something I'm doing to, and, and it's for that location specifically, like I, I have to do something that, I, that I need to track against that location specifically. Let's say I sell something to headquarters, but I ship it to a location, not to headquarters, just a different location. Then the more address entity is useless for that. I mean, just, it doesn't do anything. What we do in those cases, like I said, 99% of businesses operate this way. What we do in those cases is we create another account for that particular location. The account entity, which we use for organizations and companies more than anything, the account entity already has a lookup for a parent company. And what you do is you connect that location to the parent organization, and then that's how you establish a hierarchy. Now, by having an account, which is the actual location, now I can say who works there because I can connect contacts to it. Now I can say what deals I close on that specific location because they're an account and I can add it to an opportunity, a quote, all of that. I can use ship to look. I, I can do a lot more than what I would be able to do with more addresses. So literally the way I think about more addresses is as useless, you know, useless complexity right because it really doesn't doesn't do anything like okay so a a contact has five locations you enter them in the system and and, and that's it like you, there's it, it's just data it's just you're just asking your users to enter all this information just so you know that they own five homes or or whatever like i it just does i cannot i do not see the use for it however the more addresses entity 
in some cases, I see it as kind of the, the appendix in our bodies, which basically seems like it has no use. It's useless, but it can potentially kill you, right? That's how I see more addresses because I've worked now with multiple customers that saw that more addresses and they said to create all of those different locations as more addresses. And what they did is that they end up hacking and forcing Dynamics to use the more address entity in order to select them at opportunities and, and other things. Um, and, and, and just like nothing seems to work. They're like, okay, look, I have a customer, but I need to quote each address separately. And I get it. I know that the more address functionality, if you get into the technical side of it, you can use them. There are buttons and stuff that you can use them to pick the address you're going to ship something to. Like there is some you know extra complexity in there, but honestly, it's just not worth it. It doesn't make any sense. I never, I've never been able to find uh, a realistic, useful solution that includes more addresses. You know, if I need to capture multiple locations from a customer, I'm going to do it as a separate account in an account hierarchy where they all kind of connect to the headquarters. Or I'm not going to capture the addresses. I don't need them. It's either one or the other. So the more address entity, even though it's connected to accounts and contacts, it really can destroy a solution. I've, I've seen companies who literally spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to make something work that doesn't work. Like you make it work. Maybe you get through phase one where you're doing sales and you're like, okay, all right, no worries. Instead of using an account, I put a lookup to an address and you know, I, I maybe I did a cascade lookup. So when I pick the, the parent account, I can pick an address that connects to it. You make it work. And then you get to phase two where you're doing integrations and now your ERP systems don't understand what more addresses are. So now you're like, well, maybe I can add an account ID to that address or whatever. And then you get to phase three and you're like, well, now we need to know which, you know, assets, which devices we actually install per location. The customer assets doesn't connect with address whatsoever. It connects with account. So now you hack that. Like, you see, you get so deep into hacking and modifying dynamics to try to make it work with more addresses that at the end of the day, I've seen customers that have to pay a bunch of money to get away from that, to actually go back and do it right. And I've seen even solution architects recommend this approach of using more addresses. And I'm telling you from experience, from implementing Dynamics in over 200 organizations so far, I have never found a valid reason to use more addresses that actually produces business outcomes and business results. I've never found it. Now you can say, well, if a customer or a contact has three locations, I think that makes sense. Yeah, if you're just storing the information, but there's no business value out of that. It's just capturing data for the sake of capturing data. If you wanna know more about them, cool. So yeah, there might be a business out there that will say like, well, but the way they do it, we do it is that if they have a, a location in Florida, then we don't charge them taxes. Like, okay, there might be some weird one-off business out there, one out of a hundred, like I said. I, I don't want to generalize and say a hundred companies don't need this, but maybe one out of a hundred will have kind of a legitimate reason. I'm 200 plus, I think I'm at 247 right now, companies that I work with, I'm 200 plus in and I still haven't found that one out of 100. So maybe someday, but I've definitely found several that use the more addresses that shouldn't have used it at all. So the more addresses, not a big fan. I hate it. You know, if we're going to go for love it or hate it, I have to rate it. Um, I'm going to rate it as I hate it. I, I don't think it's useful at all. All right, number two is connections. Connections were introduced in CRM 2011. Um, it was one of the biggest features that were introduced there before connections, and I guess still today, because I think it's still in the system. Before connections, we had an entity called relationships in which you were allowed to establish relationships between accounts and contacts. And also, I believe, I'm trying to remember if it was opportunities or, no, it wasn't opportunities, it was, maybe leads or something. I, I don't remember. There were like two or three entities that you could connect to, to each other. 
The purpose of it was there are situations where a contact works for a company, but is connected to another company in a different way. For example, if you're a lawyer and you work for whatever, Johnson & Johnson is the name of your law firm, you can still represent, you can still be the lawyer of Contoso or whatever other company. So if you look at the contact record, it should say company, Johnson & Johnson, you know, law firm, and, you know, have a, then a relationship as the lawyer attorney for Contoso. So that was the goal of relationships and relationships were there since I can remember. And again, I didn't work with Dynamics since 1.2 or whatever. Like I know some other people have been working with Dynamics for way longer than me. I started working with it in 3.0. So maybe before 3.0 relationships were in there, but I think from 3.0, I remember relationships were there. They were for sure in 4.0. And then in 2011, we still had them, but Microsoft introduced the idea of connections. And the idea of connections was really, people were asking about, look, these relationships are great, but they are, they're limiting. Right, you can only connect contacts to accounts and then another entity. And I, again, I don't remember it because it's been so long since I used relationships. We want to be able to relate anything to anything, even custom entities. So if I create a custom entity called contractors or something like that, or I create a custom entity called architects, I want to be able to relate or connect architects to companies, companies to opportunities, opportunities to whatever, like anything to anything. I should be able to create that and give it whatever role I want. So Microsoft introduced connections in 2011, and I think they hit a home run. Connections still to this day, one of my favorite features in Dynamics. I use them all the time in projects, and I know Connections doesn't have a whole lot of fans. There's a lot of people that don't like connections at all. They think they're too complicated. And in some cases they are like, you know, when you're, especially when you're trying to do like metrics and, and charts and dashboards and stuff, it's like connected from connected to, you, you don't really, it's, there's a lot of complexity going in there, but when it comes to the functionality and the wow factor, when it comes to showing it to users, people love connections, right? The fact that I can take, 10 companies and connect them to an opportunity and say, look, these 10 people are bidding in this project and the project is the opportunity. And I can connect, you know, everywhere, like those 10 companies are bidding on that. And, you know, four of them are bidding on something else. And then two other people, like the fact that I can connect anything to anything, it's a really, really good piece of functionality. And I remember that a couple, a few years ago, there was there was even some functionality that was released that took advantage of connections. Uh, that would map, for example, what a company was connected to, and it would make this just super cool map, basically in Dynamics, showing you this company is connected to these opportunities, those contacts, those custom entities. Like it would it would make this you know huge web into a map uh, that that was really, really awesome. I think later on, Scott Duro uh, came up with Sparkle CRM and that, that also did that, but in a like a 3D way, which was pretty cool as well. But anyway, I'm a big fan of connections. I appreciate the fact that you can connect things to each other and I think that can produce a lot of business results. Um, so because of that, uh, big fan of connections, still use it today, so love it for connections. Number three, Word merge, uh, word merge templates and mail merge templates. Um, I will say that I'm not a big fan of these. Um, I, I feel like they haven't been, they haven't received any nice treatment in a long, long time. But the idea is that you take a record and you export everything into word or into an email um, you know, based on the information that is on that email address. It was the way we used to print quotes before and do things before. And I get it. There's some new functionality that allows you to export to Word and Excel, which is not based on, you know, merging, the merging functionality, that merging mail merge and word merge or whatever, um, that is separate uh, now, but before that, that's, that was the only way that we had. And now we have the, you know, even the export to PDF, like we have some better, you know, better ways to accomplish what we were trying to do with Word and Mail Merge templates, but Mail Merge templates specifically, not Word because the export to Word has been out for a few years now, but the Mail Merging capability continues to come up often. Like the request to use them, people trying to use them, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of mail merging and word merging. Like I, I feel like I can accomplish more sometimes with 
just a, a, a flow uh, sending out an email rather than relying on the mail merging capability. So I'm not a big fan of this one. So I guess hated will be on uh, on this one. All right, number four is follow and unfollow. That was also introduced in 2011. And, you know, the idea behind it was that you can follow a record if you're interested on keeping up with it. Um, and the system will have certain like triggers and activities that would post, that would notify you when something happens. So for example, let's say there's a deal happening and you're not the salesperson on that deal, but maybe you're the manager of the salesperson or maybe you're in the same team or, or something like that. So you're like, look, I'm not, I'm not responsible for this opportunity, but I want to follow it. I want to make sure I want to see what happens with it. All right. So you have now a button on the ribbon on the toolbar, or whatever, where you click follow. And then if something happens, let's say the, the, the person wins the opportunity, that opportunity one message will show up in your social pane. So you log in into dynamics, there's a dashboard with a wall. What are the latest things that happen? So and so won that opportunity. Awesome that you are following. And then you can also unfollow things, um, of course, follow, unfollow. I personally thought initially that this was going to be a cluster. Like I thought it was going to be too complicated. People were not going to use it uh, and all of that. But the way I figured it out later was that the follow and unfollow functionality is actually very flexible. You can with workflows and I assume with flow, although I haven't tried, um, make people follow things. So for example, I can create something where if a salesperson creates an opportunity that is larger than some amount, let's say the amount is $100,000. If an opportunity is created in the system and the and the opportunity estimated revenue is more than 100,000, then make their manager follow the opportunity automatically. You can do that with follow and unfollow, right? You can do uh, you know, all kinds of things with that. Uh, one of my favorite is you know, one of the biggest complaints from users sometimes is, you know, I really love the whole synchronization of contacts, but I have to be the owner in order for the contact to show up because out of the box filters say you only synchronize the contacts that you own. You know, sometimes there's already a contact in the system that somebody created, so they're the owner, but I do want to have them in my Outlook and on my phone. So how can we do this? Well, you can modify the filter in Outlook to follow not only the con sorry to synchronize not only the contacts that you own but also the contacts that you follow, and there's a two minute Tuesday on the YouTube channel that shows you how to do this, how to create the filter, modify it, and all of that step by step. If you're interested, but it's a really cool piece of functionality. So then during training, I tell users, look, if you find a contact in Dynamics right? Because we're teaching them, you should search before you create them. So you don't create duplicates. If you find a contact in dynamics, you want to have in outlook, but it's already in there and owned by someone else. Just follow it. You follow it. It shows up in outlook within 15 minutes and you're good to go. If anything changes with it or whatever, boom, those changes will be synchronized to outlook. No problem. So the follow and unfollow functionality, I'm a big fan of it. I, I think it's really useful. And overall, I think that the, the reason why it's powerful is because ultimately, and this is how I explain it to, to users when I train them, ultimately, people get to decide how much they want to learn about things in the system. Because the way the most companies do this is, look, if a, if a, you know, if this event happens, send an email. If a case is created, if a case is resolved, send an email. If something happens, like everything just, you know, you get notified every time that event takes place. But with follow and unfollow, you can actually say, look, I don't want to be notified about every single case that gets resolved, but this case is important, right? This case, like my customer, I'm a salesperson, I'm not a customer service person, but my customer has been adamant about getting this resolved and I need to follow this case. If you're following the case, then you get notified. If you're not following the cases, you don't get notified. So it's in your hands. You have the power of how much or how little you want to be notified about stuff happening in terms of, you know, your business unit, your business, whatever it is. So giving people the power always goes well in training. People love that. You know, you want to get an email for everything? Just follow everything. 
Uh, you can even follow users and say, look, whatever this person does, notify me. So people can really kind of drive their own user experience, which I, I really like. So follow and unfollow, good stuff. I like it. Five is merging. Okay, so merging is a little bit more complicated um, in terms of loving it and hating it because overall, I love the ability to merge. I think it's awesome, but I hate the fact that it's locked down. Like you can't really merge a whole lot of records in Dynamics. If I'm not mistaken, again, I'm not, I do, I don't do any research or anything before this shows, which is probably bad. Um, but, uh, I, I wanted to just be honest, right? Like you and I are sitting somewhere at a bar or whatever, and we're just talking about dynamics. I'm not going to have time to, you know, research before we sit down for a beer. So this is all just coming out of my brain. The merging functionality, as far as I remember, as far as I know, and again, don't shoot me if I'm wrong, only works for accounts, contacts, leads, and cases. That's it. Those are the four. You know, it's called it's those are the four records um, that it allows you to merge. Right. It changes. It kind of gets upgraded a little bit when you look at cases, because for accounts, contacts and leads, you can only merge them two at a time. But when it comes to cases, you can merge up to 10 cases at a time, which is pretty cool. So. The, the idea behind it is you work at a large organization, let's say an electrical company or whatever, um, and a lot of people are calling in to report that there's an outage. Okay, 20 cases have been created by different different from different customers, you know, or or you know maybe it's a large company and multiple users are calling in. They're for, for all for the same customer. You merge them all into one case, and all of the activities, phone calls, all of that, notes, whatever they were made on those 10 cases, they all show up into one, and uh, it's a lot easier to handle. So, I like the merging functionality, but I hate the fact that that is not flexible. That you know, that you, you can not just create an entity called, I don't know, uh, devices and or warranties. And if somebody, you know, creates the same warranty twice, registers the same product twice, you can merge them. There's no merging in custom entities. There's no merging even in out of the box entities. In some, you want to merge two assets together, customer assets together. Too bad. There's no merging for customer assets. And that is an out of the box field service, you know, piece of functionality and, and uh, entity. So this has been a request that Microsoft has known about for years. There's actually an official request. Uh, I remember if you look on the, um, on the idea site for power platform, there's one, I believe from 2019 or 2018, something like that, that had a bunch of upvotes. People are like, yes, allow us to merge anything. And Microsoft said, you know, we're looking into it. We're going to put it in the roadmap or something like that. Like it's one of those, one of those uh, statuses that says, okay, all right, we got it. You want to be able to merge anything. So we're going to put it on the roadmap and um, it's still sitting in the roadmap, I guess. I have no idea when it's coming, but uh, it's, I'm definitely going to say I love it 100% once we can merge anything. But for now, because we can't and we have to come up with our own ways to do it, which people use dialogues for this, people use all kinds of different solutions uh, in order to merge two records. Because of this, um, I, um, you know, I kind of I have a love hate relationship with merging. Uh, let's just put it that way. I remember though that a few years ago, uh, somebody posted a way to enable the merging button on any entity, and I remember doing it for projects. Like I follow the steps. It required like a little web resource, and uh, you know, the button would just show up, and it was awesome. You clicked on the button, and it it gave you the same merging you know, functionality and, and feel. It wasn't exactly identical, but it was very, very close to it. And he gave you the feel for any entity. And I think I enabled it for like, I don't remember what, and maybe it was a custom entity. I, I don't remember, but it worked pretty well. But 
then I think it stopped working. At some point, Dynamics got upgraded. The web resource, it was a free thing that I think maybe an MVP did. It never got upgraded. And I think there's a couple of companies out there that offer that same functionality. So you can pay them and they can enable merging for certain entities. But they've I've never seen anyone that has like good reviews and stuff. Um, I wish an MVP, I wish I was a developer because I think that, that would be a good thing to do for the community would be to come up with a, a universal merging capability before for Microsoft does. Um, I think that would be very popular and, and um, you know, it would be something that I would love to collaborate on or, or work with, you know, anyone who wants to make this happen because I think it would be very valuable for the community. So love-hate relationship with merging. Number six is duplicate detection. Uh, duplicate detection is, once again, another one of those functionalities that are available everywhere. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I love duplicate detection. I think it could be better, though. Um, and I think I've talked about this in previous shows. I would love to work with Microsoft on making this better. Um, I think that the reactive nature of duplicate detection is, is a big miss. I think that you should be more proactive. I think that you know, as you enter information, it should start telling you that, hey, look, you know, make it red, make it yellow, like something. There should be something that is telling you, look, I think what you're entering is about to be a duplicate because some of these entities will take you like 10 minutes of just hardcore entering data. And, you know, after you enter all that data and hit save, that's when you get a message that says you have a duplicate. I think that's such a horrible user experience. And I would love to have that, you know, work kind of like when you're when you're going on to Google and you start typing something and it's already kind of finding what's, you know, it's already suggesting stuff. So I would love to do that where, you know, you're entering a lead or entering a contact or whatever it is, whatever you're looking for duplicates. And it's already telling you like, hey, you know, this is I think this is about to be a duplicate. Um, so love it. I just wish it was better. I really like the fact that. Um, you know, duplicate detection allows you to search for duplicates across entities. I love that, that you're entering a lead and you can look for duplicates in the contact entity, for example, or the account entity or whatever it is, uh, based on, you know, your duplicate detection rules. I like that. I like the fact that it searches for duplicates when you're creating records or when you're synchronizing from Outlook or when you're importing records. Uh, obviously, when you're creating records, you do have the ability to override you know, or, or to decide basically what happens. You can say, go ahead and save it anyway. You go ahead and, you know, skip it, whatever. When you're importing records or syncing from Outlook, none of that happens. It just basically ignores it. If there's a duplicate, it doesn't create another one, which can be a problem because sometimes the data that you're trying to bring in is augmented. It has a lot of really good facts or a lot of really good information. Um, and, you know, the, the records that you have in Dynamics don't have that information. So uh, it is skipping that instead of, you know, inserting the, the information that it knows. Uh, in other words, it's not doing updates. It's only doing inserts. So if it cannot do an insert, um, it, it, it skips it. And once again, we will talk about the Import Data Wizard coming up. So just a little bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, it's on the list uh, in a couple of numbers from now. But, uh, you know, I think duplicate detection will be great. I just wish it was a little bit better. And like I said, I would love to work with Microsoft to uh, come up with a better way to duplicate detection. Um, right next to duplicate detection, we have bulk duplicate detection, which is a completely different you know piece of functionality. You actually run this one either manually or you schedule it to to, you know, to run. And, you know, I I personally am not a big fan of bulk duplicate detection because it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, it, it basically tells you I found a thousand duplicates, but it doesn't really give you a way to handle those to say auto merge them or anything like that. Now, granted, if you're going to merge them, like assuming those duplicates are based on the entities that we just talked about, like account, contact, lead or cases, um, you know, the, the merging functionality is a little bit faster, I guess. Uh, so you can go and, you know, merge through a lot more records faster than if you were doing it on the regular UI. But other than that, there's really no options. Like I wish you, you know, w when you were running it, it gave you options like, I don't know, keep the latest copy or, 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 you know, merge. I don't know. Like I, I, and I don't even picture it in my head. I know that there are some companies out there. I believe QGay does this, uh, that have like enhanced, you know, duplicate detection with merging all into one. Uh, and I should probably, you know, go and, um, 
look into it because I know those guys have asked me a couple of times to, you know, show me some of the products. They do a really, you know, good job with data and stuff. And I have to, you know, work with Roland and, and the guys at QGate to look into this. But um, I, I think there are other companies out there as well that will deal with duplicates and they do a way better job than the bulk duplicate de detection functionality in Dynamics. I don't like it. I think is you know, pretty useless. So, you know, love duplicate detections, hate bulk duplicate detection, I think is not the best. All right, so Import Data Wizard, I told you we were gonna get to that. That's number eight on the list. Um, Import Data Wizard hasn't really changed a whole lot since forever. Um, I mean, they added the ability to like drag and drop so you can you know, drag a file and into the section instead of clicking the upload button. Okay, cool. Um, but other than that is pretty much the same. It has worked the same way forever. Uh, same type of files, uh, same everything. And one of the things that are largely missing from Import Data Wizard is the ability to do upserts or updates and inserts. Um, big, big pain. Um, in order for you to do upserts, you have to kind of export the data out of Dynamics. But that is the problem, is that when you do upserts, you not always will have the data coming from Dynamics. Sometimes the data will come from other systems. It might be a list that you bought from, you know, Dun & Bradstreet or whatever. And that data comes in and you want to be able to say, I want to import this data and whatever accounts it matches based on account ID, website, like you get to pick which field you want. But based on that, I want you to update the information that I have in Dynamics with the data that I'm importing from this list. It doesn't do that whatsoever. It only does inserts. If it finds a duplicate, it doesn't do anything. It just skips it and keeps going. So it's a big pain. I like the fact that through the import data wizard, you can quickly import data. I mean, that if you're just importing, you, you're not looking to update anything. It's pretty quick rather than set up SSIS and all that other stuff. Because, I mean, if you think about the alternatives when it comes to importing data in Dynamics, you're looking at a tool. You're looking at, you know, Kingsway Soft. You're looking at Scribe. You're looking at Smart Connect. You're looking at Cozy Rock. You're looking, you know, those different tools uh, are the ones that you're going to be using to import data. And the timing it takes you to set it up, set one of those tools up, regard, even if it's just installing it and connecting to Dynamics or whatever, the time it takes to do that, you can use Import Data Wizard and import the data. I mean, it's it's just that fast. It's already ready to go. Um, so because of that, I love Import Data Wizard when it comes to simple tasks like that. But if it's a full-on migration from a system to another and obviously not no integration whatsoever, uh, support it through it, then Import Data Wizard is... It's just not the best when it comes to tools. I know that there are professionals out there that don't use Import Data Wizard at all. They don't want to use it. They rather spend the time setting up a tool because they know or they think that, you know, I, eventually I'm going to need it anyway or eventually we're going to do an integration anyway. I respect that. If that is something that you're going to do in every project, cool. But there are a lot of situations where you just don't need that. Uh, you know, you have, let's say, you know, you created an entity called state because you don't want to just have a free type field where you just type in a state. Uh, here in the United States, for example, you want to create an entity. Okay, now I can have the 50 states here in the United States again uh, in Excel, import them through the import data wizard, create the 50 states, and that's it. So I don't need to use one of those tools and create a mapping and all of that in order to do something like that. So I think the best use for the import data wizard is those one-offs, right? When you have something simple you want to import, no functionality uh, beyond that, I think it's great. I think it's great when, you, you know, the fact that you can delete the records you import it. So if something goes wrong, you have 100 records, you hit import and 80 of them imported, the other 20 fail for whatever reason, you can say, go ahead and delete the other 80. So it's very simple, two clicks, and all those records are gone. You don't have to go and search and try to find them. I don't know if the tools that we use for integration you know, are that simple that you can go and do that. Hey, go ahead and go back and remove what you did. Um, maybe some tools do it. I'm pretty sure not all of them do it. Um, so the import data wizard does do that. So once again, if the situation is right, love it. Love the import data wizard, super easy. Save the, you know, the data log or the data map rather. Use it again if you need it. Very, very straightforward. 
anything other than that, I hate it. It doesn't do it. It doesn't work. You have to use another tool for it. So once again, just like merging love-hate relationship when it comes to the import data wizard. All right, we're getting close to the end. Uh, number nine is sharing. Uh, the sharing functionality in Dynamics that allows you to share a record with another user. I'm just going to say it. I hate it. I don't like sharing at all. Um, and the reason why I don't like sharing is because sharing opens up a can of worms for a lot of different things. Um, you know, one of them is what I call ghost sharing uh, or ghost relationships, which are connected to relationship behavior. So when you look at two records that are connected to each other, like with a one to many relationship, um, there is a relationship behavior, uh, which means if something happens to the parent record, let's just use account and contact, for example or because I've been talking about accounting context the whole episode, let's use accounts and opportunities, all right? So just to change. So if you're talking about accounts and opportunities, there is a relationship behavior that says, whatever happens to the account, do this to all the opportunities below. And those actions are things like delete, uh, reparent, share and unshare, like there's a bunch of different, you know, actions in there. Um, you know, assign is another one of them. So. Typically, the way these relationships work is whatever happens to the parent, do it to the opportunities below. And the thing that makes those actions, the things that makes that possible is Dynamics or the Power Platform. It's not the user. So if a user has, let's say, if you haven't messed with the relationships and they're just working out of the box, if I own an account and let's say the security roles say that I can only see my own opportunities because we're talking about accounts and opportunities. But then I look at the opportunities and I notice nothing. I look at the opportunities. I'm, I'm in my account. I'm trying to decide whether I should deactivate this account or not or delete it. Let's just say for some reason I have delete powers. I look at these um these opportunities below, I go into the, uh, I go into the grid for opportunities and there's nothing there. Like I don't see any opportunities. That doesn't mean there are no opportunities in the system. It just means I can't see any opportunities in the system because my security roles are saying that I can only see my own, but there could be four in there that are owned by other people that are working with this account. And I don't know about it. So then because I don't see anything and I'm not thinking about that, I go and I delete, you know, that account. Well, Dynamics will then go and delete the other opportunities below it and all the activities and all the contacts and all the other child records because that's kind of the way it works out of the box. So that's why we talked about the fact that you need to modify the way relationships work out of the box because you have issues like this. Sharing is one of those issues. So I have, for example, an account and I have a coworker who cannot see that account, right? Because of our you know, security role say, you can only see your own account. So I'm going to share it with you because I'm going to go out on a trip and I, you know, and I, I need somebody to talk to this guy next week or whatever it is, or I'm in paternity leave, maternity leave. And, you know, I need you to work with this account. So instead of assigning it to you, I'm still the owner, but I'm going to share it with you. Well, just like we talked about with deletion, sharing also works and is enforced by Dynamics. So now I share my account and Dynamics goes and shares every single record below the account. All the opportunities, all the contacts, all the activities, everything it's share. So what happens is all of the sudden, the person that you share your account with to help you out while you were out, you know, having a baby or whatever, um, now they can see every single record below it. They have been shared, given share permissions to all those records. And if you go to the sharing, you know, place, the, the sharing, you know, functionality for those records, let's say, you know, you, you're walking by this user or the user raises up and says, hey, uh, Cheryl, how come I can see your opportunity? Like, I, but my security shouldn't allow me to see any opportunities that I own, uh, any opportunities besides the one I own, but I can see yours and I can see Tim's and I can see, you know, everyone's opportunities. What's up with that? If you open those opportunities and go to sharing, you will not see the user, you know, in on the list being shared. Like you cannot understand why it's happening. And I've seen administrators like, you know, we have several customers that have 
customer you know support with us and maintenance contracts with us they open tickets with us saying hey i have this user david he can see all these appointments coming up the appointments are supposed to be you know private this is a law firm. They're not supposed to be able to, you know, see the appointments, but somehow they see it. I look at the security role. It's user read user. So they're not supposed to see those. I look at the records themselves. They're not being shared. What is going on? Well, somebody shared a contact and now all the appointments and everything below it are visible to the guy, David, the guy that, you know, was originally shared the contact with. And you cannot explain that unless you understand relationship behavior. So I personally don't think sharing is very useful. And then on the other hand, even if you modify the, the relationship behavior, by the way, because I know some of you will be like, well, what if I just modify the relationship behavior so that doesn't happen? Well, that's a good step on the right direction, but you still have this thing called the POA table where essentially every single record that is shared in Dynamics goes into this table. If you look at the table, it basically says this object, this record was shared with this user with this level of sharing permissions, like read, write, delete, whatever, right? And that happens for every record in Dynamics. And now remember what I talked about the relationship behavior. It happens automatically. So when a record is shared, let's say I share an account, every single record below that account is shared too. So when I share the account, we're not talking about a single entry to the POA table that says this account is shared with David with read permissions. No, every record below that account, it's also entered into that table. OK, so imagine if that account has, I don't know, 200 appointments and phone calls and emails in the past, 200 or 100 opportunities contacts that are below, like everything basically below that record. And now you share it. So now by sharing one account, you might end up with 500 lines on the POA table. And the fun fact about the POA table is that you have no access to it. You cannot purge it. You cannot see it. You cannot modify it. You cannot, I'm talking about online. There's no way to get to it or do anything to it. Now, on-prem, obviously, you can go into SQL, find it, do whatever you want with it because you kind of own your database. But online, you don't. It just keeps entering data and keeps entering data, slowing things down, eating up your storage, and there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot get to it through bulk record deletion. There's nothing, literally, you can do to it. Plus, the POA table is not something you can migrate either. So if you need to move from one environment to another, you can bring the data, but you cannot bring sharing at all. So it's not a great piece of functionality. I personally, you know, I hate it. I, I don't like it. I don't think companies should use it. I'm a big fan of removing sharing permissions from security roles. You should either have access or don't uh, to a record. And, you know, if someone is going to leave for a couple months or whatever, just reassign it, right? Assign this record to somebody. They'll be the owner uh, and that's it. So try to stay away from sharing. If you are one of those out of 100, you know, one out of 100 type of businesses that you really, really need this, then I guess you should use it, but modify the relationship behavior beforehand uh, so you don't end up entering hundreds and hundreds of lines into your POA table every time you share one record. So, I, you know, I think it could be useful in some cases if you do your homework, but definitely don't use it out of the box just how it comes because it's a problem. And finally, number 10 on the list is reports. Uh, reports has been in Dynamics forever. Um, and, you know, it, it always comes up. I think a lot of companies rely on reports, especially if they're coming from on-premise because they could create SQL-based reports that reach out to other databases and kind of aggregate all the data together. And they're looking into, you know, reports in Dynamics 365 as well. I don't, you know, like every... As the years go by, I found reports less and less and less useful. I think that it kind of fell off like the 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 cliff uh, once Power BI came out and now we can create Power BI reports and Power BI dashboards. So I don't find them super useful. There's a couple of situations in which reports are useful, which is when you need to aggregate things and 
You need to do reports on parent and child records at once. That is hard to replicate with charts and dashboards out of the box. Um, so I think in some cases, a report might be useful. So I'll give you an example. You want a report of uh, a customer and you know the the work orders that apply to that customer. So you you want to get you know uh, here is here's the customer here's information about the customer and all the work orders below it, uh, or maybe work orders and then below that the actual actions. Like you want to go below one one level. You can do that. You can show that type of information like you know one level and then a level below. Uh, right on the same report. So there are a couple of things that are really useful. And I also like the fact that you can take the URL of a report and create like a shortcut and, you know, on your desktop and you just double click and the report executes and, and pops up with the results. I like that as well. But it's, it's not, I think it's a, it, there's, it's not enough justification to use them nowadays. Um, I, I'm not ready to say that I hate them, but I also don't love them. I just don't use them anymore. Um, rarely, rarely, rarely use them. Uh, typically use them when these are reports that were created, you know, years and years and years ago, custom reports that are really hard to replicate. Uh, for example, I remember we created one uh, report that will, it was for a company that they really had a lot of, um, you know, turnover. Like they, they had a lot of people, you know, leaving, coming and, and, and going. And uh, one of the reports they wanted to see was a list of users, what business unit they were in, what security role they had and what teams they were members of. And they wanted just this massive, you know, report to export all of that information. And we created a custom report to do that. Trying to solve that specific request with a dashboard, it's impossible. I mean, really, to show in one place, you know, every user, what business unit they're on, what security roles they have, and also what teams they're a member of, the, you can do that with dashboards. And, and it, I mean, you, you can try, but it's just not going to be as good as you can make it with a report. And obviously, in a custom report, you can add graphics and other things. But um, I, I find less and less and less reasons to use them nowadays. Um, so I um, it's one of those functionalities that, you know, it's being replaced and kind of faded out by newer and improved, you know, capabilities through Power BI and, and other solutions. So Anyway, that is my list of 10 things inside of Dynamics, uh, 10 features that have been around for a while and that are still available today for you to use. Some of them I love still today. I use them often. Some of them I hate and never use them. But um, I hope you, um, you know, you got some clarity on this and kind of my perspective on it. Um, and, you know, uh, maybe we agree in some of these and disagree in some of them. Regardless, let me know what you think about them. You can always email me at info at crmmvppodcast.com uh, or leave a comment on the episode. Uh, the episodes are also posting to YouTube, by the way. You can't really see me. I'm not recording myself doing this. Uh, maybe I should because I don't do any edits. It's just me. I really hit record and then end at the end. And that's it. I upload whatever uh, whatever I record without any edits. So maybe I should start posting the video if you want to really see me talking about this and I can reference the camera. But um, other than that, if you if you want to watch them on YouTube, you can do that. At least listen to them on YouTube. You can do that at work or whatever. Uh, or else they're all posted. All of our episodes are posted at crmmvppodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully we uh we go all the way to 200, right? Uh, it feels like man, 100 was right there. It was almost, almost, and now once you hit it, it's like man, now we're back to one, 101. That is. Um, but you know, again, I appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate all the feedback, all the love. Looking forward to seeing you in two weeks with yet another episode. We'll see you then.